as we've already talked about, we're, we're entering today into the beginning of the story of Job. And I think a good place to start, at least, is where most people go when they read the story of Job, certainly where a lot of us begin, is we see it as a book about trials in life. And we're very much drawn to something in the Bible that has to do with helping us navigate through the difficulties of life. And so I thought I, thought I would start out by um, noting just a few of my favorite quotes about the whole subject of trials. And these are by a real variety of speakers and writers. Um, as we get into the book a little more closely, I think you will see some of these quotes are going to leap out even more powerfully. Um, C.S. Lewis has written a, a lot of good stuff on the whole subject of trials. We'll look at another one of his quotes a little bit later. Uh, do you have these in your uh, PowerPoint notes? Have I included these? Okay, I may not have all of the same ones, but I think I have some of them there. Uh, Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures and he shouts to us in our pain. That pain or trials is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. That's a profound way to look at trials. They grab our attention more than most other experiences of life. And it's in those times when we re-examine perhaps some things that are going, around, going on around us. Margaret Clarkson, I'll refer to her book a little bit later, uh, has written a book on trials some years ago. Clarkson says it's not by miraculous deliverance that our faith grows, but by discovering God's faithfulness in the midst of our pain. Many of us pray for miraculous deliverance, and that's a very human thing to do. It's a very natural thing to do. Um, if you enjoy pain, you're a masochist. And most people would see you as sick in some way. So we don't enjoy pain, so we pray for God's deliverance. And Clarkson makes this great point that it isn't the deliverance that helps our faith to grow. But very much to the point of the book of Job, discovering God's faithful, faithfulness in the midst of our pain are the times when our faith really grows. Here's a paraphrase right out of the Bible of James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And Phillips has paraphrased this, I think, in, in some good language. You may remember the passage, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials and so forth. Phillips paraphrases this way. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. Let the process go on, he says, that endurance is fully developed and you will find you have become people of mature character. What I like about this quote, this paraphrase of James 1, verses 2 and 3, is it is inviting us or asking us to think of trials and problems from a different perspective, a divine perspective, if you will, in which God is using them in our lives to build qualities that he can build in no other way. That this endurance, another word that is often used in scripture, perseverance, this perseverance never comes when we're going through times of prosperity. But it will be built in us when we're going through the difficult times of life. That's a tough lesson to learn. <laughs> and I, I suppose we never learn it perfectly because when we're in pain, we're usually wanting to be delivered from it. But that in the midst of our pain, God might be doing his greatest work. That his greatest work, in fact, can come through the building of our perseverance and our patience. Um, just a few thoughts as we get started 
in considering uh, the story of Job and his, his purposes, the purposes for giving us this story. Now, here's, we've already talked about this a bit as we, as we introduced the prayer time earlier. But I want to suggest that when we approach this book, there are a couple of ways that we can view it. And in fact, if you survey different writers about the book of Job, you're going to find that they tend to, they tend to drift one way or the other. And what I'm hoping we can do is to try to do both of these in our treatment of the book of Job. Um, one approach to Job is to see it as a book about suffering. And we're, um, we're attracted to this, not that we enjoy discussing suffering, but we're attracted to this because it's a common human experience. We all wrestle with this. We all have questions about it. We all want to, be, we all want to get better at handling this part of our lives. No matter how mature you are as a Christian, things can come into your life that are going to really derail you. And all of us want to, want to understand this a little better. So we come to the book of Job and we say, ah, finally I have a story about a man who goes through suffering even more than I have. I want to discover some of the answers to my questions. So on, on one level, from the human perspective, what we might call the existential approach, is this is a book about a believer's view to, of suffering or problems in life. However, as we go further into the book, we discover there's much more here than that. And, and this is the approach that I think is the most satisfying. To put the two of them together is even more satisfying. That we try to discover the theology that is being uh, presented in this book, a theological perspective of it. And that is, we're learning things here about God. We're learning about his justice and fairness in the realm of human suffering. So we can't divorce this from suffering. That's what, that's what the story is about. But we're learning more about how God operates within this. And a part of that, a part of that theology is the retribution principle. The question of whether God always gives blessing for obedience and always gives discipline or trials or problems for disobedience. And I think you've already learned, as we've talked about wisdom earlier, that simple wisdom doesn't explain everything. Simple wisdom just does not answer all of our questions. There are questions that are unanswerable, and therefore we're led to a book like this to get a deeper perspective of complex wisdom, the complexities of God and the complexities of his wisdom, which even though this book helps us a lot, I don't think we will ever fully understand. And that's, that's what's so great about it, is we can keep, go deeper and deeper and never fully, never fully examine the depths of God's justice. At the same time, there is a strong element in this book about the wisdom of God. And that will be Probably some of you have already written on this in your paper. That will be when we get to the chapters where God speaks, chapter 38 through 42. Somehow God is going to help Job to understand that he is a wise God and that in fact addressing his issues of human suffering need to go back to a great and awesome respect for God and who he is in the midst of all of this. So both of these viewpoints I think are <coughs> are in, in play here, there's a tendency to approach the book, to approach the book viewing it one way or the other, and I think we need to do both in, in the process of understanding it. Any comments so far of how we're going to try to approach this? Because some of the, some of our discussions, some of our uh, focus is going to be on human experiences, and some of our focus is going to be hopefully on the theology of the book. I think the two go hand in hand, go together. Yeah, Franklin. I'm just wondering, is this really something we can learn through? Yeah, we, we can in some respect, but uh, I mean, if there's a 
is something that we can manage. You know, we don't feel overwhelmed. You know, we can feel, you know, the suffering is not to that extent that it overwhelms our emotion, intellectual, whatever, these aspects. I can see it's probably not strong enough. I mean, when the real trial comes, it is that moment we fear to handle them, and we could not handle them. And uh, that's where action or growth really happens. So I'm not doubt that. I, I do believe we can learn how to grow. But uh, much times I feel like uh, there's some, some extent we, we could not really learn the art of growing the suffering. It's the suffering itself and the grace that grow us. Not we. Absolutely. Yeah. We, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you saying that we, we grow more in our understanding through the experiences of suffering rather than through intellectually um, studying it? Uh, I can see, if, you know, for example, I see right now we study. I'm not against that. I think we, we can learn something, intellectually understand it. But I have to say, it is the process itself that uh, grow up intellectually even. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a oh, through, absolutely. through that absolutely. it's a really, but uh, it's just a lot of way to say that. Right? Anyway. Yeah, and, and all we can do any, any, any time we study scripture, um, we study it in a sense in the, mm -hmm. let's say in the seminary setting, preparing to be teachers, preparing to be Christian leaders, hopefully preparing in our own spiritual growth to be an example to others. We study it to be able to intellectually, maybe even emotionally, tuck things away that we will use at a later time in some kind of an experience. And so studying the theology, the reason I want to keep these two together, studying the theology of suffering leads me as a Christian, as a Christian leader, to have a have a personal theology of suffering. Things I believe about this subject, and a great deal of that theology is coming in my understanding of God and how he works, and what, what he is wanting to accomplish through suffering. Um, I, the title that I had up here a moment ago for the quotes is actually a title that I use for a book on the subject of suffering, thinking right when things go wrong. Um, thinking right is going to come through the times of trial, and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. But I believe it also comes in the preparation ourselves f to understand God better, to understand what he's trying to accomplish. Like any doctrine, it puts things into our way of thinking that later on we will use. So I would agree with you. I think the greatest growth comes when we're actually in the midst of the trials. That's what Margaret Clarkson says here. It's not by miraculous deliverance that our faith grows, but by discovering God's faithfulness in the midst of our trial. That's where the real growth comes. But that growth can come faster and more efficiently, more um, effectively if we have understood God's statements about it, or God's word about it. And that, that's, what, that's why we would look at a story like this, at the story of Job. Well, let me go back to C.S. Lewis. Another, another quote by C.S. Lewis, and this is in probably his most famous book. There are two books where C.S. Lewis deals with the subject of trials and problems in life. But this is the most famous one called The Problem of Pain. What is the problem of pain? What is the dilemma, and as you know, Lewis is a great philosopher and he brings up challenges and dilemmas and things that, are, that we need to think about. Here's the way he puts it. If God were good, he would wish to make his creatures perfectly happy. And if God were almighty, in other words, omnipotent, he would be able to do what he wishes. But the creatures are not happy. Therefore, God lacks either goodness or power or both. This is the problem of pain in its simplest form. 
You see, Lewis has really integrated here theological questions with practical questions. If God were omnipotent, he could have made the world painless. But the world, the world is filled with pain. And people, we, experience pain. Does that raise question about the omnipotence of God? Does it raise question about the goodness of God? So he's, he's taking this question, what he calls the problem of pain, back to a, some basic theological questions. And I want to even go further with this idea of our, of our questions. Um, questions that we want answered as we come to a story like Job, a story about suffering. One of those questions is certainly, why do righteous people suffer? Job is a righteous man. We learn that right away at the beginning. We'll look at that passage in a moment. Why do righteous people suffer? And then going a little bit deeper to the theological question involved in that, is God fair when he allows righteous people to suffer? Is God fair in that? And in a sense, this question would be tied very closely with um, C.S. Lewis's problem of pain. Is this somehow violating something we believe about God? I want to I suggest to you that the book of Job never answers fully these questions. It does not answer these questions. We want desperately to know the answer to these questions. And certainly the book of Job touches on them but it goes to a deeper issue, a deeper question that I think is going to meet Job's needs and hopefully will meet our needs as we navigate our way through life too. And, and the, it's this question, how can a believer build his faith in God when he is suffering for no known reason? When we simply don't know why. Now, some suffering, as you know, comes in our lives as a result of factors that we can fully explain. Um, I was with my, my nephew um, this last weekend. I didn't expect a, a trip all the way down to San Diego, two hour drive both ways and so forth. But um, we had known that this young man was struggling. He's in his mid twenties, struggling in life. We didn't know the extent of it until Saturday night. My wife and I got a call from her, her brother and learned that Roddy, our nephew, has been hooked on drugs for some time. Uh, we knew he used marijuana, but we didn't know that he had graduated from marijuana to a cocaine habit. And um, so they called us and for the first time really told us how serious this was with Roddy. Came near to losing his life about a week ago because of an overdose. And um, to add just another wrinkle into the story, another complication, this is the weird, this is weird. Roddy bought his cocaine from a dealer down there in San Diego, who also claims to be a spiritual leader in Roddy's life, and has actually invited him to a very popular church in San Diego to be a part of a youth group and, and has, has invited Roddy to come so the youth group can pray over him because of his cocaine habit. Yeah, I know, I know, I said the same thing. I said, are you sure all this is true? And, and, then, and then I went down and met with Roddy. We spent about an hour and a half together, and I'm convinced it's all true. Now, I have no idea about this weird dude and why he lives this double life mingling in the Christian world, and then selling drugs. He's been evidently selling drugs for quite a few years now. I have a personal theory about it, and the story isn't about him, by the way, but I've, my, my theory is that this is the way he eases his conscience, that he's been a drug dealer for enough, enough years now, felt enough guilt about it, that he tries to help people on the other side of things by taking them to a Christian group. Anyway. My counsel to Roddy when we talked together and 
Roddy was, we've had a good relationship through the years, and he, he said, if Uncle John would come down and meet with me, he said, I'd really like to talk with him. So, so the really good thing that came out of all this is, is we've reestablished a, a relationship to talk about some of these things, and Roddy knows that I know everything, and he just started in rehab in Riverside in a facility in, Re, in Riverside this week. So that's all encouraging if he can stick with it. But uh, I told him, I said, this guy is a weird dude. Um, eliminate him from your life right now. Make a phone call to him, tell him. He, he, just, he just had, the day before, brought Roddy a Bible. I brought Roddy another Bible. I said, throw his Bible away. Don't have anything to do with it. Um, call him and tell him you don't want to see him anymore. Eliminate those kind of people from your life because you need to make a you need to make a cut from your past and start start fresh. But anyway, I have no idea what's going on with this drug dealer. <laughs> but uh, he was trying to pose as a helper to, to Roddy in some spiritual way. Um, anyway, back to the story. Um, Roddy made bad choices. And he now is in a desperate situation in his life. And it's real easy in his life to identify how he got where he is. So sometimes in life, our choices, or maybe the choices of sin, other people who are sinful, just living in a sinful world is going to be a, the identifiable reason for a problem. We can explain it. And we know it's the consequences of the way life works. But sometimes, and I would claim that this is a story of Job to some degree, we, a man like Job experiences things that are inexplicable. And really at the very heart of what this book is about, I think this, it is, it is a book about trials, but not all kinds of trials. It is especially a book about faith that is being built when we don't understand the trials. And even though that might not be all of the things that we go through, it does represent some of them. That you and I, at times, are in a quandary. We, we really don't understand why we're going through what we are. God wants to build our faith during those times. And those are, in fact, some of the times when our faith can be built the most. Um, while we would love the answers to these questions, this book approaches answers to these questions, but is not primarily giving us the answers to these questions. It is rather dealing with the, the trials of a man who doesn't know why he is going through, why he is going through what he is. How can we build faith in God when we're suffering without knowing the reason for it? Without knowing the reason for it. Franklin. Do you think it is harder? I do think it's harder. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. From a Christian point of view, think about it for a minute. I'll just pose the question back to you. What do we struggle with when things come into our lives that don't seem to be connected with our actions or connected with bad choices? What are we struggling with? Aren't we struggling with the questions up above of God's fairness and God's character and the why, the unanswerable why question? Why would God let this happen to me? It actually drives us at times back to questioning God and um, maybe even not questioning but concluding that God is not a God who is fair. Or that God is God and not a God who is loving. Remember C.S. Lewis's struggle. If God were a good God, why would he let this happen to me? Does, don't you think that that's what we're struggling with? The unfairness of it all. The, the contradictory nature of it all. That it doesn't seem like my relationship with God should have led to this. And here I am. 
in the midst of something that is not fair. Anyone, anyone else want to chime in on that? Um, why are the unknown type of trials, by unknown I mean the reason is unknown, why are those the hardest? We do, I do, we do begin to question God, not understand who God is in the midst, in the midst of all of that. Well, let's go back to something that uh, we've touched on, obviously, looking at wisdom and looking at the book of Proverbs. And this is what we called right here on the screen. This is what we called simple wisdom. And this is the way life often works. That sin or making choices that would be disobedient to God will lead to consequences. Roddy is going through some of those consequences in his life. Uh, we go through consequences when we make choices disobedient to God. Um, if we live a life that is obedient to God, not, we're not claiming a perfect life, but a life with a heart for God, we would expect, at least from what we see in Scripture, that God will at times, many, many times, reward that in our lives. And there will be good results. That's why simple wisdom is worth following, because it is often true. And when we read the Proverbs that tell us about certain kinds of behaviors are going to result in success and others are going to result in failure, it's worth following, because life often works that way. But there are questions that come into the come into play here that are uh, they're the basis for complex wisdom in the Bible. One of those we're not taking up at the moment is why do sinful people prosper? And I'm talking about people now who don't know the Lord, they have not dedicated their life to Christ like you have, and yet if you measure it on a purely human level, they are way ahead of where you are in life. And we could ask that question. In fact, that's a great philosophical question that is also brought up in the Bible in some of the wisdom psalms. Psalm 37 and 73 are good examples of wisdom psalms. And they actually take up the question, why do the wicked prosper? This seems to be contradictory to the wisdom God gives to us in Deuteronomy 28, for example, gave to the children of Israel. This is not the question we take up in Job, but it is certainly a, a good philosophical question. Why do the wicked prosper is what these psalms talk about. Does anyone remember in short version the answer that's given to it? Or at least some comments that are made in those psalms about the wicked prospering? All right. Okay. Refuge in God, like he says. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very much so. In fact, I would agree with you that Psalm 73 deals with both of these questions to some degree. Uh, you read something, though, Caitlin, that was a part of that, the first quote that you gave, that is the answer to, uh, at least in part, to the destiny. What was that you said? Uh, yeah, it was the first quote. Something about their destiny. Yeah. 
the, the wisdom that is given about this question has to do with the short-lived joy and success that the wicked will have. And here, here we have to view life not just in this life, but from the perspective of eternal life. But I, I would even add that often it is even in this life. Their, their reward is coming. They may be at the moment, they may be successful. Those who have vowed to not follow God somehow are given a measure of success, but it's not going to last. You remember the, the passages in Scripture that talk about the, the grass is going to wither. There will come a time when it will wither. And I think the answer that is given, uh, the theme of the answer that is given to this question, why do the wicked prosper, is, don't, is, is very simply, don't worry, their prosperity will not go on. There is an end coming. So if one views eternal life altogether with this life, it is still the righteous who have the best deal because they will be rewarded by God they will ultimately be with him eternally, and those who prosper will only, their prosperity will only be short-lived. That's the reminder that is given in those passages. But the book of Job takes up this question, and it's an, it is also a part of complex wisdom. Why, do, why does God allow righteous people to suffer? And this is really the question then that becomes a focus of, of the book of Job. Now, let's uh, turn in your Bible, if you would, to Job chapter 1. I want to look a bit at the introduction to the book. Could I ask someone to read verses 1 to 5, where we are introduced now to this character of Job? Um, Franklin, do you have it there? Would you read for us 1 to 5? So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. But Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, John, Job did continue. We have here, in, kind of captured in the language of ancient Near East, some things about Job that I think are, are worth noting right as at the beginning of the story. Um, various translations use different words here, but the word blameless and upright are good words. English translations of a twofold description of Job. Uh, blameless is a word that is used in Old Testament, a Hebrew word that refers to one who is a person of integrity. It has to do a lot more with character than it does with behavior, though behavior comes out of this word. So here we have a picture of Job that is, what you see is what you get. He is a man of deep integrity, his godliness is going to show forth. But he also lived life honestly, and that's what the word upright has to do with. He made choices that showed a consistency of his faith with his life. So this, this expression, blameless and upright, is a common combination of words that just show us that he was a man inwardly and outwardly who was sold out to God, who was obedient. To parallel that, I think, we also have the expression that he, that he feared God. Now, we haven't talked about this in a lot of detail in our class. Proverbs 1.7 had said the, be, the beginning or the source of true chokmah or wisdom is the fear of Yahweh. We haven't really talked about 
what this means. You may possibly, when you teach Old Testament, have someone ask you the question, what is the fear of God? Because it's all over the place. Um, are we supposed to fear God? How do you answer that question? What do you think, what do you think the fear of God is? If you had to put it in terms that would connect with people. What does it mean to fear God? And of course a connected question is, is the word f fear or the concept of fear for us a part of this? That we're actually afraid of something as we would use it in our English language. What is the fear of God? Any ideas? What would you want to include in the meaning of someone who fears the Lord? Zach, I see you thinking. <laughs> Is, is the human element of fear in the usual way that we would think about it a part of this? Is fear a good thing? A healthy thing? Or is fear a disabling negative thing? Those are questions I think that come up from people because I think this word does cause a lot of people to struggle a bit. Franklin, you nodded your head you thought fear was a positive thing. In what sense is it a positive thing? Well, in many kind of proverbs, uh, the Lord hates. So if we don't fear, why do we care about what he, what he is or what he doesn't okay. is? Okay. Because he's, he has a really a dire consequence, which is the proverbs talking about his death, his show. So mm -hmm. the fear of the Lord's wrath and the So, the, so what you're saying, if I fear the consequences of what it would mean to go against God, that becomes a healthy thing for me. Okay. But if you do stop, can stop you to do bad things because of the fear of such consequences, mm -hmm. I would not necessarily say that's a bad thing. Okay. Good. Um, this may be a poor illustration, but let me use it anyway. Um, okay, I'm driving home today. I'm going down Alondra nearby. I'm looking in my rearview mirror, and I'm seeing a black and white vehicle with a blinking light coming on right behind me. What happens to your heart? Uh, since I've been pulled over and gotten tickets a couple of times immediately, there's a fear. <laughs> there's a fear there. I immediately begin to obey the law if I haven't been at that moment. But let's say that I was obeying the law. The fear is still there, isn't it? There's that, that police car stands for something. It's an authority. And it is, it's, it's very, its very presence is going to cause me to obey the law. And maybe by obeying the law, I'm actually going to save lives, my own life included. I'm going to do good things in obedience to the law. But without the law and without that symbol of the law there, I'm not going to fear that. I'm going to have other reasons why I might go over the speed limit and so forth. That's an imperfect illustration, but... What Franklin is saying, I think, is really true. The fear, fear at some level can be a positive thing in our lives if it motivates us to do the right thing. Um, 
I'm not sure if you would agree with this, probably not every parent would, but when our daughters were younger, really young, and they didn't fully understand why they needed to follow rules, there was a certain part of our relationship that I wanted them to fear discipline. Uh, they knew what we had told them they could do and they couldn't do, but they didn't know why. And so that fear, and this is where a lot of parenting struggles, is you also want to establish love at the same time of fear. Authority goes along with love, and that's a, that's a fine balance sometimes to be able to, to manage. But there's a healthy, healthy nature to fear. And I think what, the reason this word is such a difficult word for so many is it's most often seen in a very negative way most often seen as a crippling kind of thing that keeps us away from being who we really are. But in scripture, if God stands for perfect righteousness, there's a healthiness about fearing that God because it will motivate me to obedience. And I think that's supported by a common, um, a common expression that is tied together with fearing God. Fearing God and shunning evil, we often find those two together. Fearing God and keeping his commandments are often found together as expressions. And so this reverence for God, I certainly think the reverence is there, is accompanied with a healthy fear of the consequences that might come from disobedience. So it leads me to stay away from poor choices, stay away from evil. This is what Job is like. This amazing man. Um, his net worth is listed for us there in numbers of sheep and camels and oxen. This would just, just be a way of showing uh, a man's value, uh, the things that he has he has ownership over. And by all, by all measurements, Job is a very, very wealthy man. His wealth has evidently spilled over into his influence. Um, he is seen as the greatest of all people in the East. In other words, he would be like a Solomon figure in a different kind of way who would be respected by all of the people. And we'll find out a little bit later that he was also in leadership roles in his community, that he was in fact seen as a great, as a great leader in his community. Uh, and then we go on to his more personal life. And here we would have a reflection, at least one passage, I think, that might indicate to us the time in which Job lives, that he is likely prior to the Mosaic law. I don't, I don't think Job is a Hebrew of the Hebrew faith. I think he likely is coming from one of the surrounding nations around Israel. Uh, but he is one who is practicing devotion to God through the sacrificial system, the sacrificing. And prior to the giving of the Mosaic law, that would have been done by the patriarch of a family. A father, grandfather, others, leaders in the family would have offered sacrifices on behalf of their children as a part of what God had commanded them to do. Uh, Job not only offered sacrifices for the sins of his children, but he he even says, well, I wonder whether they might have sinned today. I think I'm just going to make sure and offer a sacrifice. A very dutiful father, by all indications, a very loving family. They gather together for these potluck dinners um, and so forth. So a lot of good things going on in this family. And that's what we're supposed to see. In, in the story, this man is a, is a family man. He is a godly man. And then we ask the question, well, where did all this get him? <laughs> and in many ways, that's what we struggle with, is the story very quickly turns. Now, I want to read what happened to Job. But I'm going to read it in a special version of the Bible. So please do not look at your own Bibles, because I have a, I have a unique Hebrew manuscript here that's been translated into this, the real story of Job. And here is the story. Listen to me. Now there was a day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the, old, the oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job who said, 
Job, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone, as your servant, have escaped to tell you about this. While he was still speaking, and another came and said, Well, the fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to come and tell you this. While he was still speaking, there came another who said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, there came another who said, Job, brace yourself for this. Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness, and it struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon these young people, and they're all dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. A little bit later, this version of Job's life says, And Job was struck with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Presumably, he's sitting in a garbage dump. The broken pottery would represent parts of pottery that are in the garbage dump. And his sores are so bad that he is scraping them to handle the uh, itching that is happening there. Now, that's the story. That's the story. Um, What is the story that I've just told? And why did I tell it like I did? And you, astute Talbot students, know there's more to the story, right? But why is this really the story? And why would this be an accurate way to read Job's account? Well, it's very simple. Because that's the way Job saw it. We have a tremendous added advantage in the reading of chapters 1 1 and 2 of Job's story, in that we get some information that by all indications, Job never knew. Even when God speaks later in the story of Job, there is no evidence that he ever told Job the rest of the story. And of course, the rest of the story is going to be a scene that takes place in heaven. What I read read to you is the human story. This is exactly what happened to Job on earth. But you and I are led in through the literature that we have in our hands. We're led into a side of the story that no one knew. Probably Job or anyone else ever heard this from God. I don't know that for sure, but there's no indication in the story that they did. And of course, it's the conversations that take place between God and another character in the heavens, the Satan, he's called. The conversations that are going to go back and forth between God and the Satan. Um, What do those conversations tell us? You know them well. I left them out of my story, but you have your Bible there. What do those conversations tell us between God and this character referred to? I think in your reading, you've read this, the Satan. The Satan is just a Hebrew word that means the the one who accuses, the accuser. What, what What are those conversations about? Zach? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, in that conversation, Job becomes almost, um, you're, you're absolutely right, a, a human figure is going to prove something, right? He finds himself caught in a scheme that is, by the way, is proposed by God. Remember, who, who brings up Job initially? Have you considered my servant Job? It's God who brings up Job, not Satan. Now, Satan's going to do the attacking, but it's God who first brings up Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Anyone else? Franklin, do you have a sense here? What, what is the accuser who may be the chief of demons that we know from New Testament teaching is a fallen angel and so forth, Satan himself? We don't have necessarily full, full reason to claim that here. He is obviously an adversarial angel, so he is at least a demon, but he may be, in fact, he's among the angels, but he may be, in fact, the chief of the demons, and that would be Satan himself. When God brings up, have you considered my servant Job, Franklin, what is the accusation that the Satan is making? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, what a great example of a human success here. But um, don't make any claims about his godliness because the only reason that he's a follower of you is all the good things that you've given to him. So you see at the very heart of this story that we will claim is a story about suffering is really a challenge of the nature of faith. It is a question that is being raised, a challenge that is being given to God about the genuineness of faith. What is this man's faith really based on? Is it based on all the things that you've given to him? Or as God would claim, is it based on a love and a devotion just for you. Satan has seriously raised a question here that's an important theological and philosophical one that's behind the scenes, and that is what, is, what is true faith? And what motivates true faith? And in Job's case, is it just the good things that God has given to him? So, now that, that's, now that that question is introduced, what does God do? Well, he's the great orchestrator of human experiences. And he comes back to the Satan and says, let's find out. Let's find out whether his faith is based on the prosperity that I've given to him on all the good things or something else. And that's when we launch into the story that I have just read. God is going to allow, and I think a good word here is allow, it's going to allow the God of this world, Satan likely, the character Satan, to take away, to take away many of the good things, not all of the good things, but many of the good things that God has given to him. And we'll find out. We'll find out what Job's response is going to be when those things are taken away. So behind the, behind the story of suffering is very much a story it has to do with faith. What is the nature of true faith? What motivates true faith? Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.